After a period of uncertainty, those above, concerned for his safety, were relieved to hear the faint voice of George rising up from apparently several dozen feet below. They were able to make out his excited words to the effect that he had fallen into a large tunnel and encouraged the others to follow him. They did so, and when they were all in the tunnel, they stood in stunned silence. The passage, which stretched out from them in both directions, was not like the common, natural cavern passages which they had explored for the past few days. In fact, it seemed more artificial than natural, approximately a dozen feet in height and about the same in width. The tunnel was similar in shape to a subway tunnel, having a dome ceiling and a flat floor. What really caught their attention, however, was the fact that the tunnel was illuminated by a greenish phosphorescence to the point that they did not need their carbide lamps to see their surroundings. The strange luminescence seemed to emanate from the walls of the tunnel itself, which were clear and glass-like, yet at the same time extremely hard. In one direction, the lighting effect faded out into blackness, while in the other direction, the light seemed to increase. One of the members suggested that the light might be coming from the surface, and that they might be in one of the old mines which existed in the area of the cavern entrance, but others brought up the fact that, according to their calculations, they were at least five miles beneath the earth, and therefore the light probably did not come from the surface. Subsequently, the explorers decided to investigate in the direction of the light, since it would allow them to keep some carbide in reserve for their return trip. At one point, the tunnel, which was apparently cut through solid rock much of the way, and then glazed over with the hard, transparent substance, opened into a giant cavern. Actually, this occurred several times, and at intervals, as if those who constructed the tunnel intentionally meant for them to intersect the various cavern systems. Did the ancient builders of this tunnel system possess a combination of gravometers, x-rays, and sounding radars to detect these cavities? Even as it passed through these large caverns, the tunnel still continued in the form of a transparent, domed enclosure, still the same shape as before, yet this time, the hard, transparent substance was in the form of a wall a foot or so thick. Barney relates that her people use boring machines to bore tunnels into the earth. These boring machines heat the rock to incandescence, then vitrify it, thus eliminating the need for beams and supports. A tube transit tunnel is used to connect the cities that exist in various subterranean regions in our hemisphere. The tube trains are propelled by electromagnetic impulses up to speeds of 2500 miles per hour. One tube connects with one of their cities in the Mato Grosso jungle of Brazil. Many tunnels are unsafe and closed off. All tube transit tunnels are protected and are designed to eject uninvited guests. An inner earth group for the simple enjoyment of discussing outlandish ideas in a humorless, serious manner. Gradually, I became interested by the considerable volume of circumstantial evidence. I now believe the earth is absolutely honeycombed by a web of tunnels that run beneath the continents, under the oceans, and these passageways link the subterranean cities of the inner world. There are many reports concerning a vast tunnel called the Roadway of the Incas, which has the entrance somewhere in Peru. It runs south more than a thousand miles. There is another entrance to this fabulous tunnel in the desert of Atacamba in Chile. The highway of the Incas passes under Cusco, the legendary city of Peru. There is another smaller but very well hidden entrance to the tunnel in the mountains near Machu Picchu. I started to investigate the highway of the Incas when I was young. Curious youth, and I have hundreds of witnessed notarized statements. These documents and tape recordings fill one room of my home. The Incas knew of the tunnel, and, although gold was of little value to them, they hid their treasures in these caverns. The highway is the largest of the tunnels, and it connects all continents. In addition to the openings in South America, there are entrances in Canada, in British Columbia, in America. You should investigate Mount Shasta in California, and Mount St. Helena in Oregon. The tunnel is connected with Tibet, and another opening in Central Asia. I believe the African entrance is in the Atlas Mountains, in the north of the continent. I also suggest that you explore the highways which have been found in the oceans. These ancient underworld civilizations may be mining our seas. 
Are there other cities in existence? Oh yes, there are many. There are over 100 inner earth cities. Some of them are very similar. How does one travel from city to city, or from surface to inner city? Probably the most common method is what we call the tubes. It is a series of underground trains. We board tunnels that run underneath all the oceans and all the continents and connect all the cities in several of the retreats. The trains, which look very much like a subway train, are run on a cushion of air, an electromagnetic cushion, so they never actually touch the sides of the tunnel. This cushion creates a force field without friction and therefore can achieve very high speeds. The following unusual story appeared on page 71 of the November 1958 issue of Fate magazine. One of the most baffling disappearance cases on record centers around a truck coal mine three miles east of Pikeville on Chloe Creek in Pike County, KY. On a warm day in September 1949, Marvin Johnson, 20, and his cousin, George Johnson, 19, were working at the mine with their fathers, including Tom Johnson Sr. They ignited a fuse to a charge of black powder to loosen a coal seam. Then they left the mine to eat their lunches and await the blast. They heard the muffled explosion, and, after waiting until the smoke had cleared away, the two boys started toward the mine entrance to resume shoveling. They carried an old-fashioned carbide cap lamp, which later was found unlit at the mine entrance. That was the last their father saw them. They were in there, Tom Johnson Sr. later said. We saw them go in. As the hours passed, and the two boys failed to appear from deeper in the mine, where they were thought to be working, their fathers grew alarmed. They notified the state and federal mine, and within a few hours, over 200 men were searching the mine's dangerous labyrinth of crisscrossing corridors. The searchers found no trace of the boys. A pair of bloodhounds brought to the mine found no trail. After three weeks, state and federal mine inspectors reported that they were certain every part of the mine had been investigated, and that there was no possibility that a rockfall had sealed the two cousins in an abandoned room. State police circulated a missing persons bulletin, and police authorities in cities to which the boys might have gone were notified, but no clue to what happened to the boys was ever found. The river lessened in size as Nizwe Basque proceeded, and toward afternoon he arrived at a high-walled pass through which the stream ran. The river being low, it was not difficult to find a way along its edge, which on the inside opened into a fairly large valley through which the river meandered. Following this, Nizwe Basque came upon a burned-over area fully the length of six war canoes and fully half as wide, the surface being as smooth as the surface of the deep water in a river. Vaguely troubled as to what may have caused this burned area, Nizwe Basque prepared to spend the night and on the morrow start the journey home. Even as he sat by his fire, he became aware of being watched in the half-light of twilight. He could not see who or what could be the cause of it. There had been no sign of bears or other large animals, yet that feeling of being watched persisted. Then he remembered Caliph's remarks to the effect that this was where the legendary giants had vanished. Still, why believe old squaw's tales? Those were only to frighten small children. The feeling of being watched became stronger. Then the creatures appeared, the things that had been watching him. Even as he saw them, he knew what they were. They were the bow is, neither man or animal, yet with the cunning and vileness of both. Creatures which in olden times had boldly stolen children and women from the tribes, but they were supposed to have disappeared a long time back. The bow is slowly shambled towards Nizwi Basque, making peculiar sounds as if laughing at some monstrous joke. Panic-stricken, yet quite unable to move, Nizwi Basque watched the slow approach. Then the creature circled him, removed his bow and arrows and knife, then with two in front and two behind, they marched him back the way they had come. Nizwi Basque, though terrified, had time to observe these creatures closely. Each was about the size of a youth, though in shoulder breadth equal to a man, bow-legged and with long unkempt hair of a dirty brown color. Each was clad in loincloth and sandals of some smooth, shiny material 
and at each belt was a knife and a small box-like affair which appeared to be a weapon of some sort. The creature in the lead headed for a low overhanging cliff at the base of which an opening to a cave was visible, followed by Nizwi Bask and the other bow is. Nizwi Bask would have fled there and then, but even as he turned, one of the bow is aimed his box-like weapon at him, causing extreme pain and paralyzing him completely. Amid wild, peeling laughter, Nizwi Bask fainted. When he regained consciousness, he and two of the creatures were traveling in a weird conveyance that made little sound, yet traveled at great speed along a wide, shiny road. Inside the cave, it was quite light, for the very rock overhead shone with a pale, silvery color. Ever downward, their conveyance went, then finally came to a stop in what seemed to be a vast cavern. Nizwi Bask had no choice but to follow the creatures. He looked about for an exit, should escape be possible, but saw none save the way they had entered. On all sides towered terrifying monsters of metal that somehow or other seemed to have lives of their own. One or two even glowed with a weird blue light. Beyond that, his mind could not conceive or describe. One of the bow is aimed his little weapon box at Nizwi Bask, causing that intense pain and paralysis, after which they dragged him over and chained him to a ring set in the floor of the cave. Then they proceeded to place around him in a half circle, a pile of wood collected for this very purpose. Then this was set alight. He knew what his fate would be. He was to be roasted alive. Already, the heat from the fire was unbearable. Realizing their captive's crazed fear, the bow air screamed and danced themselves into a frenzy, as moans and cries were forced from Nizwi Basque's seared and cracked lips, then merciful unconsciousness. Nizwi Basque awoke to a feeling of infinite coolness and comfort. Then he realized that he was still in the cave, but on that strange vehicle, and being returned to the surface, but instead of the hideous creatures that had taken him down to the cave, the other occupant of the conveyance was a man, huge and fair in coloring. The giant seemed to be aware that Nizwi Basque was awake, for he turned and smiled, and spoke through his lips that did not move. Have no fear, Nizwi Basque you will be returned to your people. Those whom you call the Boes in this cave are no more. While we were absent, our home was discovered and occupied by the Boes. The gods were kind that we returned when we did. Through Nizwi Bas's mind ran the stories told to him in his childhood region of the giants who had visited his people in ages past. Surely, this being was also one, I, even the same, as were not of these ones of ancient times immortal. Soon they reached the cave entrance, and the giant, Nizwi Bask, got out of the now motionless vehicle. Dimly, Nizwi Bask could discern the outline of something huge resting where the burned patch of earth was, and he knew somehow that this monster had caused it. The giant broke in on his thoughts in that way of speaking without uttering a sound. I will return you to your canoe at tide water. Do just as I instruct you to. Stand within the circle I have inscribed. Close your eyes, and do not, on any account, open them. With that, the giant left Nizwi Bask and entered the cave again. Just then, Nizwi Bask felt a sickening, falling feeling, as if he were falling from a great height. Then the feeling was gone, and he looked about to find himself on the sand near his canoe. Another story. When I got back, I found him there, boiling coffee and frying bacon. He was glad to hear I had found no signs except for cougar tracks. After eating, we built a barricade around the door of the hidden cave, stacking up the so tall roots, which lay about in hundreds. Inside the barricade, we unloaded the mules and made up our beds. Before closing up the barricade, we hauled in some brush for fire and a good supply of fresh so tall, so the mules would have browse in case we were attacked by Native Americans or outlaws. By building our barricade against the canyon wall, we knew we could take the mules with us into the hidden cave if we were attacked. When I was ready for the night, I showed Cousin Jack the secret door to the hidden well. He agreed with me that it would be safer to go through the cave by night. After it got dark, I opened the door. Cousin Jack's eye almost popped out of his head when he saw the big stone turn in its sockets. We carried in the tools in the bucket and lit two lanterns 
Then we went down the drift into the cave, and soon reached a turn, where we were almost blinded by a sudden flash of light. There followed a sound of water dashing against the rocks. The light was gone with the speed of lightning, which it was like, though it was brighter than any lightning I had ever seen. How pale was the light of our lanterns after that brilliant flash. As we went down the draft, the flash was repeated every so often, each time followed by the roar of waters. As we went deeper into the cave, a rushing wind swept about us when the flash came. At each flash, we could see the roof, on which were hundreds of handprints. We could also see plainly the bones and veins in our hands. A sudden turn to the right brought us to the hidden well. It lay below the floor at least six feet, steps having been cut to reach the water. The pool was about twenty feet across. The flashes showed a few fish and a frog in the pool, the light being so strong we could see every bone in their bodies. We put on our dust glasses to protect our eyes. At each flash, the water in the pool rose, dashing from side to side, throwing a heavy spray over us, but never overflowing. Then would rise from the drift a pitiful moan, which put me in the mind of a person in agony. It gave us both the creeps. Oh, oh, mercy, mercy, it seemed, began the low, sad cry, getting louder and louder, and ending all of a sudden in a shriek, as a rush of cool air swept about our legs. There must be a volcanic vent nearby, said I. It puts me in the mind of geysers I've seen in Yellowstone Park. Dame, old son, I'm afraid it's the bloomin' Tommy Knockers, the bloody bounders. I've heard them in the tin mines of Cornwall, England, on the ghost shift, knocking warnings to the miners to let them alone. When they make the rat-tat-tat, it's time for the cousins to pick up the tools and pull for the top. Come along, come along, old son, let's get out of this bloody cave. It's neither ghost nor spirits, said I. You're not going to give up, are you, till we've looked for that cache of bullion. At mention of the bullion, he forgot his terror, and we pushed on down the drift. As we went down, the noises grew louder and louder, and the air became heavy with sulfuric and other gaseous odors. When we had gone down about a thousand feet, we came to a side drift, with its mouth almost closed, from a fall of rock. A short distance down this drift, we stumbled over a pile of skeletons, at least a dozen lying close together. Had the victims died of bad air or of starvation? Searching about, we found nothing but broken Native American crockery. Pictographs on the wall may well have been the story of their death. In this drift, we neither saw the flashes nor heard the moans, but the poisonous air soon made us drowsy. Going back to the pool, we examined the olives standing around it. All had lately been filled with sotol. The fresh marks on the wall nearby may have been made for visiting Native Americans. We tasted the sotol, which is a good deal like mezcal, though it is much stronger. It was something like scotch whiskey, with a strong, smoky flavor added to it. Outside, we found everything as we had left it. Cousin Jack helped me carry some boulders into the cave, which we piled up so I could examine the handprints on the roof. The marks seemed to have been burned in with a branding iron, or impressed there at a time when the sandstone in the roof of the cave was still moist. I have spoken with many Native Americans since, but none ever seemed to know the meaning of the sign. The flashes kept on. One of my legs had been badly broken some years before, and it still gave me much trouble. I got the idea that since we were able to see through the fish in the pool, we might be able to see through our bodies. Stripping off my clothing, I pointed out the weak spot and asked Cousin Jack to watch it during a flash. Jimmy, old son, he exclaimed. At that point, your bone looks as if it's hanging together by a cobweb. Cousin Jack now wanted me to look for a bullet in his body that had never been found by the doctors. He said sometimes he got a pain in his shoulder and he suspected the bullet was there, though it had entered his body near his heart. Sure enough, when he had pulled off his clothing, the flash showed the flattened lead against his shoulder bone as plainly as if it lay in my hand. I marked the spot with an indelible pencil he dug out of his pocket, and later on, the bullet was cut out by an army surgeon. Our bodies seemed to be affected by the light. Old sons, said Cousin Jack, I feel as if I could run like a deer, but before long, we were both in a big sweat. The Cornishman, being a great smoker, his body gave off the smell of tobacco. We dressed and headed for the opening of the cave. How fresh was this early morning air, yet we nearly fainted from the change when we first left the cave. 
Tired as we were, we built a fire and boiled some coffee. After we had a bite to eat, I said to Cousin Jack, You turn in now, and I'll keep an eye on the camp. I'll cook a mess of beans, so we can have a good feed before striking out for your battlefield. He needed no coaxing, and in a few minutes, he was dead to the world. After watering the mules and putting the beans on to cook, I decided to time the flashes in the cave, but my watch had stopped, and I soon found out that it would not run in a cave. In order to not drop off, I had to keep walking. As it was near sundown, we made ready to leave, but first we ate a big mess of beans and finished our army bread. While Cousin Jack tore down the barricade and packed our supplies, I did some more scouting. When we got back, we covered all our signs and fixed the vines over the secret door. Then we were off. I received the following letter from Richard Toronto, who published the Shavertron newsletter, which is now an online e-magazine, which can be accessed at this link. The letter was dated July 13th, 1980. I quote parts of it here. The tunnels under Washington, D.C. is a new one on me too. I paid good money to a researcher for info on Shaver, and I wound up with this. The guy's name is L. Frank Hudson. He says he talked to an engineer in Washington about it. The engineer claimed that the tunnels were encased in a kind of hard glass-like substance and have been carbon dated to several thousand years old. He claims that the founding fathers knew all about these tunnels when they built Washington, D.C., laid it out according to these tunnels. He said that Washington, the president, often went with Ben Franklin to a cave for meetings. Sirs, the most singular thing has happened to me, and we are at a loss to offer an explanation. It might be a prank, but unless someone is willing to spend a good deal of money on a prank, it must be the truth. On July 29th, a tall man, wearing a long blue or black overcoat and a dark hat drawn down to conceal his face, went to a former residence of ours in San Francisco, asking for us. He was told that we had moved, and the landlord tried to find a card bearing our forwarding address. Dry as he might, he couldn't, nor could he remember even the city, but he said he thought it was Portland. When told, the man answered, I quite understand. If you find the address, kindly write them and say, the man from Agordi seeks them. On August 5th, he reappeared in Portland, in an apartment house where we had once lived. Again, our address was missing, and again he left the same message, adding, I bear a message for them from the king. In both cases, after we had gone, our forwarding addresses were found, and both landlords wrote to us immediately, apologizing for their oversight. They said he impressed them so much that they could not forget him. Both of them misspelled Agarty in their letters. Who is the king? Can he be referring to the fabulous, so-called, king of the world, the king of Agarty? The only solution we can suggest is to publish this letter with our address, and hope that this time, the man from Agarty, if he be such, will find us. Page 6 of the Hollow Hassle newsletter, which was published by Mary Martin and Tal Levesque during the 1980s, and carried the following information in issue number 9, Harpy Indian Legend, A Journey from the Interior. A long time ago, the Harpies lived in the underworld, or in a land beneath the surface of our planet. Life in that region was like on the surface of the earth, and the Harpy people were very happy there. But a time came when crops failed due to a lack of rain, and the people became unhappy. When they looked up to the sky, they could see a great hole there, and this was a sign to them that there may be another land on the other side of the sky. Harpy leaders led the people through the hole to the land on the other side. Similar legends are told by several other Native American tribes. Harpies have a concept of sky gods, rituals and ceremonials for them, which take place in the underground. Givas, the ancient and sacred temple of the Harpy people, which symbolizes the interior world, which was the land of the Harpies before coming to the surface. The underworld slash sky spirits play a secret, important, unseen role in the life of the Hapi. We will continue to keep peace with all men, while patiently waiting for our true white brother, whose duty is to purify this land. The Hapi's ancestors, a journey from Maldek. A long time passed, and there were other worlds and other peoples. We are now living today as descendants of people who were saved from the other world, because there, the living stream change from good to corruption. There were good people, and they asked Masu, the creator, or messiah, 
for permission to come live with him. These peaceful people from that earlier world were permitted to go live with Messiah in the interior of the earth. They became the first Hopis. Hopi means peaceful people. Ancestors of the present Hopis originally came from the destroyed planet Maldak and its moon, Melona. This planet and its single satellite were known as Lucifer and Lilith in the Old Testament. They were destroyed by thermal catastrophe, hydrogen destruction. Lucifer and Maldak are known today as the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Note, they apparently took refuge in the subterranean slash cavern world after coming down from Maldak, according to the legend. Harpy Prophecy We were warned long ago not to take part in the Free Great Wars. Apparently, according to Harpy Prophecy, there will be a Third World War. There will be two forerunners of the true White Brother who will witness for him. Does this relate to the following scriptural reference? And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy. In the last days, strange lights will be seen in the sky, and they will be watching the Harpy people to see if they are following the life plan. And these strange lights will report to the true white brother, and they will tell him when it is time for him to come again. The following letter appeared on pages 165 to 166 of the February 1948 issue of Amazing Stories magazine. Sirs, I have contemplated writing to you for some time, but have put it off until now. I have just finished reading the first issue of the Shaver Mystery magazine, and I believe I know what I want to say now. I know that on three different occasions, about a year apart, I was shown the entrance to a cave. I thought it was just a dream, but since reading your Shaver Mystery magazine, three identical dreams of the same cave entrance take on a new meaning. I know exactly where this entrance is, and I can draw a map of it. It is in Nevada. Please believe me, I mean what I have written. I am not trying to pull a fast one, and I will cooperate with you 100%. The following strange letter appeared in the March 1947 issue of Amazing Stories magazine on pages 174 to 175. Sirs, I am very sorry that at present I am unable to give you a map showing the location of the cave which I described to you in my last letter. I have visited the cave once since I have been home so I should not have any difficulty finding it again. I am attending the Speed Scientific School at the University of Louisville with the hope that I may be able to better carry on my investigations and get to the bottom of this mystery. My English professor is very interested in the Shiva mystery and has been very helpful in giving suggestions and aid. The cave was exactly as we left it some three years ago. I again saw the glowing walls and the arrow showing the way to the strange metal which I have previously described. The machine which we had seen before was again in its place and I examined it without learning anything new. However, I did manage to contact one of the people which you say inhabit these caves. I had just returned to lunchroom after looking over the metal and machine when I decided to explore some of the other passages branching off from lunchroom. I chose the passage to the left of the one marked for me and traveled several yards before seeing anything of interest. About 100 yards from lunchroom, I came upon several pieces of silvery metal and noticed that the walls of the cave seemed to have been covered or plated at one time with the same metal and that some of it had cracked and fallen away. Some 50 yards farther, the cave seemed to be in better repair, and the walls, ceiling, and floor were completely covered with the metal, which acted as a mirror and reflected the beam of my flashlight until the whole place was flooded with brilliant white light. I turned out the light and soon after saw what appeared to be luminous dust swirling around close to one of the walls. As I watched, this dust materialized and took the form of a man about five feet high. He appeared to be about twenty years old and spoke with a low, mellow voice. I had been expecting something of this sort after reading your letter and was not too surprised to prevent myself from getting out of there fast. He spoke English very well, but seemed to have some difficulty in talking slow enough for me to understand him. He spoke for several minutes, and as far as I can tell, his conversation went something like this. The angle is zero. I am safe at zero but the machine is broken, and soon will be ninety, and I will have to go. Infinity, ninety, and I won't come back, because they will. But in a year, if their research goes well, we'll have ninety and zero whenever they want it, but now we follow the earth. Be sure to wait 
and give the 4 to 45, but then always tell when I will try to contact you. Zero, be sure to wait, and then we will talk again, and I will tell you all about the machine, and that which puzzles you. You have the secret, but I am learning about the infinity from zero, and 270 and 380. I am their prisoner, and must return before they discover I am gone. He disappeared without giving me a chance to question him, and I made no more discoveries. I hope to be able to visit the cave in Kentucky, near the home in Louisville, again in the near future, and will try to get some pictures. I would appreciate if you could throw any light on the subject, and also let me know immediately if you want to keep in contact with me. Very few people believe any of this that I have told you, and I'm beginning to think that maybe I should drop the whole thing and seal up the cave. What do you think I should do?